Kind of, da, da. Blue is your color for sure. Oh, good. Yep, here we go. Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. We are so fortunate to have today's guest come on not once, but twice this month. He often graces us with his presence once a month, but we are so lucky that we get a double this month. His name is Dr. Doug Lyle. I'm sure if you know who I am, you know who he is because he's one of my favorite people from whom I learned so much. He has a wonderful podcast that he, podcast that he co-hosts with Dr. Jen Hawk Wednesday nights at 8.30 p.m. Pacific time called Beat Your Genes. He has his own little community called the Living Wisdom Library, which you can join for less than a price of a cup of coffee. And he's just one of the funnest people I know. Please welcome Dr. Doug Lyle. I just love having you on because I don't have to do anything. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah. It is so fun. Okay, so we have so many questions. We'll get to as many as we can. And guys, please get on my mailing list because the best way is to get them in the queue. I have to give priority to the people on the list. And all you do is respond to the email once a week that comes to you telling us who the guests are. Okay, I find this question very interesting. And I think possibly you will too. This is from Jeffrey. Dear Dr. Lyle, Many people lose extraordinary amounts of weight on a low-fat, whole food, plant-based, starch-based diet. And then they go on to write books, gain social media followings, and start YouTube channels only to gain all or some of it back. I am wondering, is this because weight loss and weight management are two distinctly different processes that require different skill sets? I recently read a book called The Talent Code, and I'm wondering if the reason most people fail at maintaining weight loss is because they have no experience at it and haven't wrapped enough myelin. I've heard you talk about myelin before. Yeah, uh, it's a very good question, and The Talent Code doesn't really have anything to do with this. Um, the, the wrapping of myelin has to do with physical skills. So for example, learning how to type or learning how to throw a football or shoot a basketball or knitting, uh, that's how we wrap myelin sheet. It doesn't have anything to do with high order principles like uh, how, how do I think through calorie density, okay? So uh, it might have to do with, it would have to do with, uh, for example, chopping up a bunch of vegetables and making a soup in your kitchen. Because by the time you've done that 10 times, uh, you are more effective and more efficient as a result of some myelin wrapping uh, that, than you were before. So, uh, but in general, no, it's the, the, those two things don't have anything to do with each other. The, uh, the fact is, is that the, the very same things that you need to do uh, to lose the weight are the very same things you need to do to maintain it. Uh, what, what happens is that uh, if we're trying to understand uh, behavior at all, why people do what they do, specifically why they ever change what it is that they do. The reason is cost benefit analysis. So the mind uh, does a very sophisticated cost benefit analysis uh, as it essentially runs a series of experiments. Uh, so basically all your life is is one great big laboratory uh, where you constantly try something and then see how it works. So today I have an acai bowl uh, the reason I have an acai bowl today, I didn't, I didn't, I never had one five years ago. I got introduced to acai bowls about three years ago. Um, and since that time, I've probably had a couple of hundred acai bowls. So every, every now and then, probably once a week or so, I have an acai bowl. Why? Because it's in my memory and my memory knows what the experience is. It's a little indulgent because it's pretty sweet and therefore I don't generally I uh, like to eat too much fruit sugar at a time, uh, but once in a while I will do that. And so that's a, uh, so what, what's motivating me there? Well, multiple things. Um, you, one of the things that we have, for example, is we have a part of our cost benefit analysis with respect to food has to do with changing it. So by, by having a, a, a essentially an exploratory openness towards a diversity of experiences around food that will cause you to be less likely to wind up nutrient deficient. Okay, so the desire to eat a variety of different things is uh, undoubtedly an evolutionary adaptation to, uh, to the basically pushed people to eat a variety of different foods if they were available in the landscape 
in order to reduce the likelihood of any deficiency. So there, that's one of the reasons why I will go to a place, um, a market here that does a really good job on an acai bowl and I'll eat an acai bowl once in a while. That's because the oatmeal starts to feel like, nah, I just don't feel like eating oatmeal today. I feel like something slightly different. Now, uh, and that's probably what that is, is a, a, an algorithm uh, built in the machine looking for diversity. The, um, now, so when we're trying to figure out why anybody ever changes the behavior pattern, we look for cost benefit analysis. And so uh, there's different ways for, uh, in other words, the cost benefit analysis must change. So if, uh, if I was living in a Cuban prison and every day they gave me some oatmeal with a banana in it, uh, I wouldn't one day decide, you know what, I'm not going to eat this because it'd be like, uh-uh, you better believe I'm going to eat it. It's all I'm going to get. So therefore I'm going to eat it. Okay. So as soon as I get out of there, then I'm going to be looking for something different. But the point is, is that, that it all has to do with the cost benefit that's in front of you. So people change their diets behind cost benefit analysis. So some people, a few people, it's not super uncommon, can lose an awful lot of weight. And so what they do is that they hear about this way of doing things, and they've probably tried 40 other things uh, that one, one way or another failed uh, ultimately. And so they try this. And some of the advantages of this are that you'll actually feel better physically than you will on a paleo or keto diet. Uh, you'll also... And uh, not be looking to limit your food intake. In other words, that you're eating to satiety. So that's pretty cool. If you're someone who's fought, you know, your waistline your whole life and you thought that the way to lose weight was to eat less than you wanted, you get to lose weight without losing your mind. So you get to eat to satiety. So that's a, so people, and if they, they experiment with this, and a lot of people that experiment with this will, will abandon it very quickly. Uh, because they're, they're in the pleasure trap and they're not willing to go from 1,500 calorie pound food to 500 calorie pound food. They're just not willing to do it. And that's fine. Uh, the promise of what might be in store for them over the horizon is not worth the current sacrifice. And so their mind simply runs that cost benefit analysis and keeps coming up with the idea that says, nope, no, that's not worth it. Now, once in a while, somebody does. And so if they stick with it long enough, what happens is, is that their taste preferences go through an ad adaptive process where that 500 calorie pound food is very satisfying. That's because it was designed to be satisfying in nature. The fact that you were eating cheese pizzas and, and chocolate chip cookies, you know, uh, et cetera, before and ham sandwiches, you were eating those before you're eating 1500 calorie pound food. And now you're eating potatoes, rice, beans, soup, um, you know, vegetable soup. Suddenly, you, you are able to not just tolerate, but you're fine with eating 500 calorie pound type of food. The, uh, if, if, you, if you are able to stay with the experiment long enough, that's likely to be what many people will experience. The, um, if they do that, then they find something else out that a month later, they're down seven pounds. And it's like, wow, I like the food well enough. It wouldn't be as good as a Domino's pepperoni pizza and a Coca-Cola. In other words, it wouldn't be as dopam uh, dopamine intensive, but it's good. I feel fine. And so um, maybe they experiment with a Domino's pizza. They wake up the next morning, you know, with their mouth tasting all salty and dehydrated and they stink like pepperoni. And they're like, yeah, I don't think I don't like, and their stomach doesn't feel good. And they're like, you know what? I'm not going to do that. So they run an experiment. Now they may go back, now they're on a good healthy diet and the months go by and there's little enticements out there that they may partake of now and then. But the truth is, is that they pretty well stay on course and then they lose hundred pounds and they lose a hundred pounds and it's pretty transformative for their life. In fact, they may get a YouTube channel and they may write a book or whatever it is that they do. So, but now what happens is very often what happens is when people have lost a lot of weight, they, they, um, uh, what, what will happen is, is that the cost benefit analysis changes. So now the cost benefit analysis 
to go from 250 pounds to 150 pounds, that may have been spectacular, but the difference between 150 and 152 is no big deal. So now they start to indulge. Why? Cost benefit analysis is rigged in favor of the pleasure trap. And so they're proud of themselves. They keep getting good positive feedback. Everything is fine. And now they start to slip. Okay, well, now they start to adulterate the, the palate. And now it turns out that the healthy foods don't taste as good. So now they have a little more. Now they're 155 pounds. Now, they're, now they feel, for example, a little embarrassed that nobody can still tell, but now their self-esteem is hurting because they know they're being hypocritical. And so at some point, they, they may essentially go on strike in full-fledged ego trap where they display to themselves that they're not trying. So now they just like, forget it. I'm going to just go and I'm going to eat at Old Mary's Southern Kitchen and I eat that food that I know that I really like, which is oh, I don't know, grits and ham and whatever the heck it is. Now they go the other direction. Now they kick over the table and now they gain another 10 or 15 pounds. And now they're like, well, now what's the point? They, now, now they have to go back through the same process and now they try to hold the line and now they're in a mess, okay? So the reason why people lose their way, uh, oftentimes the reason why they change their behavior is because of the cost benefit analysis has changed. So they were, uh, they were uh, in, in a very fine, what I call a deep groove for a long period of time where they were continually doing an excellent job because they were doing an excellent job. Their self-esteem mechanism recognized that. They felt very morally sound and right with the world. They continued to lose weight. They kept, kept getting positive feedback. This, was a, this is what I would call an achievement cycle. So it just, keeps, it just keeps circling around and reinforcing itself. When something goes the other direction and it starts to go, go, go sideways, it can be very difficult to reestablish that momentum, okay? So that's actually what happens uh, to people is that, that the, the difference, uh, when you go from 152 to 150, all you did was keep doing what you were doing uh, under a self-disciplinary and self-esteem driven process and you kept, you know, it's just one in a long chain of positive feedback that came as a result. Uh, I think often what happens to people is that when they, when they hit an equilibrium, so let's suppose our gal hits an equilibrium at 150. So now she continues to do uh, the right things for three or four weeks and no more weight comes off. Hmm, interesting. So when that happens, the cost benefit analysis starts to change, doesn't it? Because part of the momentum of the cost uh, of the entire behavioral streak was that there was a feedback system that kept signaling to her, you're making progress, things are going well, you're making progress, things are going well. Finally, a month goes by and she continues to do the right things and there's no more progress. So you can now you can start to see, wait a minute, the cost benefit starts to possibly change. And so now they nibble, they're like, well, what's, what's the difference then? So now they start to nibble and if they start to nibble and they eat some junk, they go on the scale, there's no difference. You can eat a lot of junk food before you can gain a pound. You can eat quite a bit, okay? And you're gonna eat a lot of junk food before you gain three pounds of legitimate fat. That would be 12,000 calories overage uh, at say an overage of, an indulgent overage of 500 calories a day. That would take you three weeks, 24 days to gain three pounds, uh, chomping away a lot of crap. So you're not gonna hardly notice that on the scale for a while, long, you know, and by that time, the pleasure trap has now adulterated your palate and now you're in a trap, okay? So that's a lot of the analysis of why this is a very difficult thing to do. You have to sort of be mentally prepared for the fact that you're likely to hit an equilibrium at some point where there'll no longer be positive feedback from the scale, okay? So, uh, and God forbid that happens when you're still frustrated with your physique, because if that happens, that can really add to a what the hell attitude uh, and a willingness to now start bending the rules and then get back in the trap. So yeah, complicated question and a lot of different considerations. But whenever we're trying to understand anything, we, we look through the lens of cost-benefit analysis and that's going to help us figure out what's going on. 
So Dr. Lau, do you believe that weight loss and weight maintenance are the same process or different processes like the questioner asked? Well, they're the same process. And I would say to do it properly, you do exactly the same things to lose the weight as you do to maintain it. The, um, the difference is, is that you are, you're doing that under slightly different circumstances because when you're losing the weight, you're getting the additional source of positive feedback of continued improvement. Okay, once you've reached equilibrium, you no longer have that. And so that's, a, that's taking away a bit of the profit out of the business, okay? So therefore, you know, it depends upon where you land. If you land in a place where you're not happy with it, then you could be pretty frustrated. If you land in a place where you're pretty happy with it, then, then that's fine. It's not as big of a frustration. So the, the frustration that particularly, you know, uh, a person who might be that vastly far overweight may have the genes that they may, they may not get as felt as they were hoping that they were going to get. And that can, that can contribute to a shift in their motivation uh, once they've stopped losing. So that's a, that's sort of an Achilles heel of that process, but no, the, the, the process of losing and the process of maintaining uh, it's the same behavior pattern uh, under slightly different um, reward circumstances. That's, that's, that's why it's hard to maintain because we've reduced one of the rewards, which is the feedback that says that you're continuing to make progress. Wow. That's interesting. Yes. So uh, basically I think what you're saying is in order to maintain the weight loss, the person has to do exactly what they did to lose the weight and not change the game. That's correct. Exactly. Yes. I wonder if this applies to other processes other than weight loss. <laughs> yeah, I think it does. Uh, I think that for example, if you are, if you are uh, shaking alcohol or some drug addiction of some kind, the, um, there can be a, there can be a pride, an extra edge of the pride as you get through certain milestones. Um, and you can feel, you can feel like, okay, I've done a year now, or I've done six months now, et cetera. And part of the value of doing this was to essentially prove to yourself that you could do it. That's a, that's an important component. So one of the problems is, is that, that once that has been proven, um, then, then a lot of times the value of continuing to prove it has dropped. So the cost benefit can shift on you. Cost benefit can also shift just because some unknowing acquaintance offers you a drink. You know what I mean? And now very quickly, you have to run a computation and it's like, well, who are they? What do they mean to me? And what would it mean for me to refuse? And then I have to, I have to basically display the fact that I've got an issue with alcohol and I don't know that I want to do that. So suddenly the person can be in circumstances where when they were in an earlier part of the process, there may have been more incentive to prove to oneself, et cetera, that they could do this. And now a little bit later on, those cost benefits can change. So yes, I think similar that the overriding principle here is AJ is that in any, in any, um, uh, process of any achievement, the, the, the forces that are, that are guiding the motivation are always in change. Okay. We don't know when you have some kid that goes away to a university that one of the things that they are maybe doing is to just to prove to themselves that they can hack it. So they may do a semester um, and they may say, that's it. I, feel, I don't feel like going to school anymore, but they proved to themselves they could do it. Or they could go and they could find out that they were way too chaotic. Uh, they was just too exciting to do all the goofing around and, and you know, essentially uh, young adult wacky behavior. And they thought that they were going to go there and go to class, but now it turns out that they're not. So what was a good high school student under more structure is now a disaster under less structure. Why? Cost benefit analysis. Okay. So we're all, we're always looking at why people do what they do, particularly with respect to change. So we're all trying to learn more because as we learn more about things that are important to us, what the learning does is it alters the cost benefit analysis. So sometimes you learn more about something and you decide not to do it. So you're thinking about buying this vacant lot in Lake Elsinore 
and looks like a really good price. But now you find out that actually there could be a big, you know, water plant that's going to come in just two blocks down. Now you're not so excited about it. In other words, so your mind and your motivation is constantly in flux uh, behind new information. Sometimes the new information facilitates action. Sometimes it deters it. Okay. And so that's why, that's why we have to look at that question when we see people struggle, because there's something, uh, particularly if they were doing well before and they're doing poorly now, something has changed in the cost benefit analysis. And sometimes we try to figure out what that is. Great. I don't think people realize uh, how slow the weight loss process is because some of the means they lose weight, it happens more quickly. Absolutely. This is why coaching this is why the, uh, I direct people to this, uh, that your groups and uh, for people that binge and so forth, I direct them to Justina Frisa, uh, that, that she's a great coach for this. I try to get people to places where it is that they can, uh, they can talk to expert people who can, can educate us in ways to do things more effectively and easily, therefore change the cost benefit, or also help us calibrate and understand what it is that we're up against so that we can be more effective at reaching uh, the goals that we that, that occur to us would be worth doing. Great. Well, this next question sort of fits in because you actually mentioned that with this way of eating whole food plant-based, a uh, little bit lower on the fat, people can eat to satiety. And it, it's a question from Pamela, and you did do a whole video once on weighing and measuring, but this is actually a different question than what you covered in it. And she says, dear Dr. Lyle, except for the plant-based educators, all of the other weight loss programs and those designed to treat fruit addi addiction absolutely insist on weighing and measuring your food. They say it's the only way to be successful. Obviously, they know nothing about plant-based nutrition or calorie density, but they insist that even non-starchy vegetables must be weighed because they believe people suffer from what they're calling a volume addiction and can no longer be trusted to even know if they're full. They also say that in order to overcome food addiction, animal protein is necessary to heal brain neurotransmitters. I've searched the medical literature and I don't see anything to substantiate either of these claims. So are they just making this stuff up? Why are these programs still so popular when almost no one can sustain them? Um, good news about your bad habits. So uh, everybody would like to hear that, that they have to have some steak and chicken and some fish in there to, in order to lose weight to improve their neurotransmitters. So that, that was one of the great, uh, the great wins of Eat Right for your type. Eat Right told you, oh, well, you're the kind of person that you need cheese. Oh, you're the kind of person that needs steak, you know, based on your blood type. <laughs> so this is straight John McDougall. Uh, people love to hear good news about their bad habits. The... Um, no, there's no truth in any of this. Uh, there, th th this is a, I actually read, I think, uh, who's the woman's name? Susan Thompson. Uh, mm -hmm. I read in her book, I, I didn't read it because I, I couldn't, uh, but I, I read a, a section of it where she basically makes the claim that people have lost satiety feedback signals somehow, and therefore they no longer function. That's, that's so ludicrous, people. The, uh, there's no evidence anywhere that anything like that even remote, that is even remotely suggested. Uh, that that the, there's, no, there's no animal models that have ever shown that anything like that happens. This is all just, just made up, okay? So yeah, whatever, uh, I don't know what on, what on earth research, uh, there, there was no citation. Uh, there, in other words, I, I don't know what it is that she's quoting or what it is that she thinks she's seeing. Uh, but no, there's no, there's no evidence that, that this works this way at all. So throughout the animal kingdom, uh, just, to, just to bring a, the wide angle lens on this question, the, uh, do we see any evidence that animals in the animal kingdom need to be deliberately blocked by people from overeating or else they're going to get obese? No, no. So uh, to the best of my knowledge, the penguins aren't suffering from an obesity crisis and neither are the aardvarks, okay? And neither are the cougars and neither are the elephants and neither are the tigers and neither are the giraffes, okay? To the best of my knowledge, there's no species that is out there in the wild that is suffering from an obesity crisis, nor do they when they run into an environment of bounty, 
okay? They just don't. They have satiety mechanisms that need to be working throughout the lengths of their lives, just as you've got, for example, oxygen saturation mechanisms that are regulating how much you breathe. So if you run up the stairs, you are instantly in an oxygen deficit and then you'll breathe more, okay? Uh, if you are on a hot day and you're out there working, you will quickly become dehydrated and now you're gonna get thirsty. You don't need to think about getting thirsty and God forbid, you don't need to go in and measure how much water you're drinking. Uh, can you imagine? Uh, the, these were important questions in the history of life on earth for animals in order to motivate them to balance their behavior optimally between various survival challenges and various reproductive challenges. So every beaver needs to figure out, well, how more solidly do we have to make the beaver dam? And uh, how far from the water do I dare go to get a tree because I'm a beaver and I'm slow and therefore I have to be careful about how far I, away I get from the shoreline in order to uh, get, the, get the materials needed for the beaver dam. I need the beaver dam materials because without that, I'm not gonna have a mate. Without that, without a mate, I'm not passing on my genes. Um, we need a place you know, in order to, to, to do all this, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So the, the creature has to be running very sophisticated cost-benefit analysis on how much time and energy it involves in going and getting food versus building a deep beaver dam versus how far, it, you know, how good of materials it should seek for the beaver dam. Uh, literally, they've got instinctual mechanisms as to how many, how many children they will have. Okay, they're not gonna have twice as many or half as many that would be optimal. How many eggs does a robin lay? In other words, it, it, it lays about the right amount of eggs given the features in the environment that indicate whether there's gonna be enough food to feed those eggs. So what I'm getting at is that animal minds are magnificent arbiters of conflicts of interest as they try to figure out how to optimally behave in an environment. One of the most expensive things they do is to go get food. So in other words, it takes time and energy to do it. And it takes time and energy away from other survival and reproductive problems. So as a result of that, you wouldn't expect a creature to have a mistake where it would systematically end or even starve to death in the face of plentiful food, nor would you expect it to systematically overeat. Why would we ever suspect that it would overeat? We don't suspect that it overbreathes. We don't suspect that it oversleeps. We don't suspect that it overly drinks too much water. We don't suspect that it drinks too little water. We don't suspect that it can't tell when it's getting too hot or too cold. In other words, we recognize that an animal is exquisitely designed in order to respond to various and numerous different threats and opportunities to its survival reproductive success. And it doesn't put its thumb on the scale with respect to any of them. It balances them as exquisitely as possible according to uh, algorithms that are built by the genetic code. How could it be otherwise? Okay, that, that's why if, you, if a mosquito is biting you uh, and you look down on your arm and see it, and then suddenly, you know, your Doberman just got loose and you see him charging, charging out of your yard, you don't stop to slap the mosquito. You instantly know that you've got other things involved, not even having to do with your survival, but you know, the kid down the street's survival. In other words, you are exquisitely designed to actually balance around your time and energy. It's complicated. Sometimes you think, well, I should spend more time dancing and less time you know, working at the factory. Okay, It's a different sort of an issue. You are not designed to make a mistake on a biological process with very complicated feedback systems built in you to not make these, those mistakes. Okay, If you have a little thing in your eye, and you don't need to run away from a predator right now, and your eye is bothering you, then close your eyes and blink and try to get rid of it. The pain in there will tell you, this is serious business. This is your eyeball. Let's make sure that we don't have you know, tragedy and lose any of our eyesight. That, that is more of a problem than a kink in your finger that's hurting you a little bit. It instantly tells you, whoa, this is very serious. Okay. The, um, now, so there's be no reason for us to ever suspect that human beings would 
be miscalibrating the amount of food that they're eating and not getting it right. The only reason why we would ever think that they would get it wrong would be as if we could somehow trick the mechanism with phony food that was somehow puffed up. Um, you know, would there be some way to do that? Turns out, no, brain's pretty smart. And the reason is it has multiple mechanisms to try to figure out how much food it's eating. And so um, it's gonna turn out, yeah, it's pretty hard to beat it with diet food. It kind of knows that there's no calories in it. The, um, but when you feed it overly rich food, it was not designed to actually calibrate rich food in large doses consistently. So it, it, uh, it has limits as to its accuracy. And so when you overwhelm those systems with extremely rich food, uh, one of the main things it relies on for satiety is the weight and volume of the food. And very rich food has very low weight, uh, it's very low weight, very low volume for calories. And it's unnaturally rich. And so people will actually systematically overeat those foods. The, uh, they're actually motivated to eat those very aggressively. That's because those foods were rare in nature. So that instituted an aggressive cramming instinct. And so you would go ahead and eat those uh, to the point of even past normal satiety, incredibly. Uh, that's because those would have been exquisitely rare opportunities for human beings to defend themselves against starvation. And they would have added extra fat on their bodies as a result of doing that when they had those opportunities. Those opportunities would have been few and far between, but when they did happen, maybe a few times a year, people would go ahead and choke it down uh, aggressively. The, uh, the notion that you cannot trust the satiety mechanisms during normal circumstances with normal caloric density of foods is ridiculous. That's like saying that you have to carry around an oxygen monitor to monitor the oxygen in your blood to make sure that you breathe more aggressively uh, in the next two minutes because your blood oxygen level has dropped because you, you, you can't, you're not sensitive enough to it. Ridiculous. You don't have to carry around a, a caliper to tell you how hydrated you are either. And you don't need to carry around a temperature gauge measuring the temperature of your skin to tell you when to put on a sweater and when to take it off. These things are all automated mechanisms and a tremendous amount of neurological machinery has gone into um, making them very accurate. Okay. So the notion that you have somehow lost the ability to calibrate how much to eat uh, in the modern environment through some mysterious process, it's ludicrous. Uh, the reasons why people are so much heavier now than they were in 1970 is because the foods that they eat is a lot richer. That is the reason. So people were heavier in 1980 than they were in 1970. They were heavier in 1990 than they were in 1980. Uh, this isn't having to do with neurological damage specifically in the stomach or small intestine. This has to do with the increasing march of the pleasure trap as the food has become richer and richer and there's been less and less natural food in the diet. So that's the, the answer to that. Yeah, don't weigh and measure your food, get the food right. So this notion that the only way to heal brain neurotransmitters, whatever that means for food addiction, that, that's, that, that's not grounded in science. Totally insane. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I just noticed that you, your kitty's in the background. Oh, yes, she is. There's the, there's the, there's the killer of the group. I, I've never seen her actually catch anything and eat it, but she does get excited if she sees a uh, butterfly. And I'm guessing she doesn't weigh and measure her food. She does not weigh and measure her food. Great. Okay. So we're switching gears a little bit away from weight loss to social media with a question from Danica. Dear Dr. Lyle, many of the plant-based doctors and dietitians have large Instagram followings, which I'm sure helps them sell books and perhaps get clients. Some of them post very good scientific content, but many of them do these goofy videos where they point to things that appear and disappear or even dance or eat or get very political. I find this very unappealing and unprofessional. Am I just old school that I don't want to go to a medical professional who's dancing on TikTok? You know, these are individual preferences. The, the modern world has now exploded um, um, uh, into essentially uh, a friend of mine, a friend of mine was, uh, has been called the Forrest Gump of technology. <laughs> In other words, he, he just kind of happened to be 
where all kinds of different things were breaking free. So he was, uh, I believe he produced the very first uh, broadcast uh, uh, onto the internet. It was the Golden Globes in about 1997. Uh, it was done through the technology of a company called Interview. It was later bought out by somebody else and God knows what it is that it does now. The, the technology, he, he, said, he's, uh, he said to me 20 years ago and wrote an article that he had written in about 1996, I think, that everybody's going to become an actor and a producer and a director. <laughs> that was amazing. Uh, I read this, uh, I probably read this in, like I said, about 2002. He said, oh, let me show you an article that I wrote. And I'm looking at it and he said, he goes, just wait and see. You're going to have little kids with cameras all over the world, standing on their hands, you know, blowing bubbles and, and making the bubbles look like hearts. He says, there's going to be no end to what it is that you're going to see. And I just shrugged my shoulders and in 2002, I had no idea what was coming. Uh, we didn't know that an iPhone was going to exist. And uh, that wouldn't come along till I don't know, 2010 or something incredible. So what do we have now? Everybody's a producer, actor, director. And so you're going to see everybody's personality is now going to start coming at you. And so I'm not surprised. I guess I am kind of surprised because the, uh, if, there was a, if there was an audience that I would think would be um, if, if I'm if I want to listen to a plant-based doctor, I want to hear the facts. I want to hear, hear nice, careful reasoning. I want to actually hear that you're you're not too wildly open because I'm concerned that the error of the movement, the fact that it's so different than mainstream, I want to know that you got enough feet in the conventional world that you are that, that you're not just a wacko. Okay, so uh, and that, that 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 would be my preference. So I don't, uh, I don't, I don't mind seeing Michael Greger in tie. Okay, he's pretty, he's a pretty open, pretty open character. But that tie and his white coat tells me he's paying attention. He's thinking, he's trying to think conventionally at the same time he thinks openly. And uh, uh, for example, so the point is, is that yeah, my my preference would not be to see my uh, medical experts act like TikTok stars. But hey, to each his own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just can't imagine like Dr. John McDougall dancing. I just, I don't know. No, John's not going to dance. The uh, neither is Colin. So the the yeah, but this is preference. Uh, and some some young doc, you know, expresses their personality in a different way, and that may some people may resonate with that. They may feel more comfortable. They may feel like it's friendly, and they may it may not. Uh, it may not deter them from believing in that person's expertise. So this is, these are all, uh, every, everybody's an actor and a director and a producer, AJ. And that's what, uh, that's what the world has turned into. And, and now we get to see what people do with that. I mean, I just can't imagine going to your doctor in person and them doing <laughs> <laughs> like for an in-person visit. Anyway, thank you so much. Okay, well, you, you talked about um, the modern world, and this question is about the modern world from Jordan. Growing up when my dad would stop for gas, the attendant would fill the tank and wash the windshield. Now we pay at the pump. We used to have to interact with the bank teller to do our transactions. Now everything can be done on the AT at the ATM or online. Everything, including groceries now can be delivered. And if we do go to a store, we can do self-checkout. My kids know no other world. And I'm wondering if limiting all the interaction with fellow humans is affecting their ability to relate to others and to all of us in a negative way. Uh, no, I don't think so. These are, these are common sort of questions that are pondered by a lot of uh, social observers. And uh, th things, things change, in other words, but so circumstances change and the way it is that we, some, some of the patterns of interaction uh, that go on uh, in the world. So for example, I can remember when, um, when there was, I mean, so many things that we could remember, but I can remember when there was no such thing as a, as a store attached to a service station. Uh, service stations uh, used to be owned by individual operators, not by big corporations and individual operators would have a, have a garage uh, in there where they would fix cars. And so, uh, but, but the idea of selling anything in there other than Pennzoil uh, was ridiculous. And it was that, so things change. And now 
now we don't meet the mechanic or the owner operator of a, of a Union 76 station when we go in to buy gasoline. Instead, if we go in the little store, it's not even a little store, it's a big store. And, uh, and we go in that store and that, that person there couldn't know, wouldn't know a distributor cap from a differential. You know, they don't know anything about cars. So the world changes and uh, your, the interactions that you have with people, the, uh, the, the types of interactions that you're gonna have specifically are going to be altered behind that. But the fact that you interact with humans isn't gonna change. And so, and the, and, and humans are humans and they will not change. So uh, you don't learn really social processes. These are natural, um, these are natural uh, evolved mechanisms. So you are, you are going to be, you're going to look at the world and interact with people differently at 25 than you do at five. Uh, you, 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 you are located in a different, different ecological niche as a five-year-old than you are when you're 25 years old. And um, so I'm not, I'm not worried about the social impact of any of this. Uh, another, another thing that I'll hear is everybody lamenting that, oh my goodness, the damage done to our children as a result of the COVID year. There's no damage done to your children as a result of not going to school. It's not damage. It may be unpleasant and opportunities lost for enjoyment. There's a big difference, okay? So if I, if I have to sit in a, you know, uh, you know, if I was playing basketball outside with my friends and then a rainstorm comes and it crashes down and I can't play for three days and there's no gym open, uh, there's no damage done to me. I'm just like bummed that, you know, my friends came 500 miles and we were gonna have this little tournament outside for three days and we we're all gonna play basketball. And now we don't get to do it, okay? so. The, so life changes and opportunities change. And so in the new, uh, as the world changes, it's the nature of its interactions. It's gonna change the nature of the opportunities and it's gonna change the patterns that people do. But what people seek out of their interchanges with, with other people will never change. They're, they're always seeking uh, esteem related processes through romance, friendship and trade and, and family. That's what they do, and they always will. Well, you say there's no damage done from COVID, but do you think any damage has been done for kids by these things? Because they, they often don't interact with each other. It's just through the phone. Yeah, I don't think so. In other words, the once again, well, let's talk about, let's talk about the difference between um, lost opportunity and damage. Okay, there's a big difference. So, so if a kid sits in front of the TV, and watches Gilligan's Island's reruns for six hours. Has it done him any damage? No, it hasn't done him any damage at all. He, 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 he would have had a better experience likely had he been out on the street playing hide and seek with his friends, okay? Uh, but, you know, he didn't. So uh, he's inherently lazy, he's a TV watcher, and that, that's what he wanted to do. So he, his nervous system following energy conservation dynamics um, wound up with what I would call a, a five out of 10 for the experience of those six hours. In other words, it wasn't terrible. He wasn't afraid. He wasn't depressed. He wasn't miserable. Um, he wasn't terrified of anything. He was mildly amused, okay? Now, would he have probably had a better experience if he tried to build a fort with his four, with four neighborhood kids? And, uh, and then put little tunnels through it and everything, probably probably would have had a better, better experience. But he ran a cost-benefit analysis on that and his inherent sort of laziness and, and, and he, he took the easy five rather than the risky seven and that was derivative of his personality. And so we all might say, we think he made a mistake and we might be right, but the, the taking a five for the day was not damaging. That's the important concept. So we, we wanna separate the notion of damage from um, less pleasant. There's a big difference. If I eat an orange that isn't very tasty, it doesn't do me any damage. If I eat an orange that is tastier, it's more enjoyable, but the difference in terms of its health support is so minor as to be irrelevant. You're such a calm voice of reason. You make people less worried about things, I think. Yeah, I hope so.
Yep, absolutely. Even just your voice. Okay. Well, we are going to switch gears completely here. Where did this go? Oh, okay. Um, another question on infidelity. Christian says, I've heard you speak about infidelity from the male perspective, but never from the female one. My question is this, since most women say that they would prefer a monogamous mate, why do they cheat with married men when statistics show that they are more likely to be cheated on by a cheater? And I Googled this and it did, did say that that's true. Yeah. So I, uh, I'm see if we can figure out what the question is, AJ. Well, it sounds like to me that he's asking um, that you've talked about infidelity a few times on the show and you've talked about it from an evolutionary perspective, but it's always been from the male point of view. And if I'm interpreting the question correctly, he's asking you to talk about it from the female perspective, because most women I know say they would prefer a man that's monogamous. I'm sure there's sure. exceptions. But, you know, Oprah Winfrey used to say, if he does it with you, he'll do it to you. And I Googled it just to see if the statistics were there. But the statistics show that if a, that, like, if you're, if, if a single woman is dating a married man and he leaves his wife and marries her, that he's statistically more likely to cheat on her. So I guess the question is, could you explain infidelity from the female perspective? And, you know, why, if they don't want it done to them, why are they doing it to some other lady? I have, would have always described it from both perspectives. So I think that's an incorrect indictment. Uh, so the, the, and from the female perspective here, there would be multiple perspectives that we could be discussing. We could be discussing, is the female being unfaithful in her relationship? That's one perspective. Why would she do that? The other perspective would be, if I'm a female and I'm in a relationship and my husband's being unfaithful, that's another perspective. Third perspective is I'm a single female and I'm having an affair with a guy that's married. Okay. That's a third perspective. So we got all kinds of different questions and dilemmas that might where quote infidelity is a, is a part of the picture. So I guess we could look at all three. So let's suppose that I'm a female and I'm in a relationship and I am being unfaithful. Why would that happen? That would happen uh, largely because uh, that usually happens. Females are usually seeking out uh, males that are, that are, uh, i.e., we always go back to understanding anything. We go back to cost benefit analysis. Okay. So the, um, uh, so the notion is they are running a cost benefit on that behavior. And if we, we were to look, if we were to look um, very in a, in a very narrow view, we would say, well, why would they do such a thing? And the answer would be, well, uh, because the, 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 fear, the, the, the new partner is in some ways superior to the old partner, okay? And so uh, what, what do we mean by superior? There, there are features of the new partner that are, that are subjectively judged by that woman to be superior to their old partner, okay? So what, what could those be? Well, maybe he's handsomer. Maybe he's wealthier, maybe he's funnier, maybe he's smarter, maybe he's more, more capable sexually. Um, there, there are all kinds of reasons. Or for example, it could just be that he's none of those things, but my current partner isn't very interested in me. And therefore I don't, it doesn't make me feel attractive and wanted, okay? So you start to realize, okay, we're not exactly sure why the female would make that choice, but Certainly, we understand that the reason why she's making that choice is that she's running a cost-benefit analysis, and the cost-benefit analysis is telling her that it's worth it. Otherwise, she wouldn't do it, okay? Now, is she right or wrong? Well, how do we know? She has to run an experiment, okay? So she's being compelled by the cost-benefit analysis to run that experiment and find out. She may find out you know, after one encounter, no, it turns out the guy's way worse than my husband in bed, or he's just lousy, or, or it's weird, or he stinks, or, he's, or I, have, I have really don't have that much interest in it, or I just wanted some excitement, and now I'm really not that interested. Who knows what may go on in her head? Most of the time, if women carry on uh, an extended uh, relationship, uh, extramarital affair, they are usually very interested in that partner. And they are seriously considering switching partners if, in fact, the new relationship is solid, which it usually isn't. Okay. The reason that's true is the, uh, 
uh, the, the woman understands that she's under circumstances uh, where the male is well aware that he's not going to be able to easily, without a fuss, have a new long-term partnership. After all, she's married, okay? So part of the allure to him is that she's already shacked up and he doesn't have to, to face the, the financial consequences of, of caring for her and being supportive. So in, in essence, most of the time, uh, this is casual mating strategy on the part of the male that's engaged in a relationship with a married female, okay? That means that he is looking short-term. The female usually is not looking short-term. She's usually looking long-term. So this is a classic dynamic in male-female dynamics where the males are uh, far more interested in short-term, casual, non-committed relationships. This isn't 100%, and I'm sure there's people out there saying, well, that isn't true, it wasn't true for me, it wasn't true for my Aunt Millie, who, you know, the guy was crazy about her and wanted to marry her, and she just wanted to have a fling. Of course, there's always going to be exceptions in any individual situation, but if we were to look scientifically at the broad trends, we will find that the broad trends clearly demonstrate that when married women are in extended uh, romantic relationships with a, with a third party, the, they are usually in love with those parties and they would like to have a long-term committed relationship with those parties, okay? And usually what happens is sometime in, uh, in a year or so of that, if it survives that long, there is a decision that's made. Okay, so usually they are not able to remain in limbo indefinitely. Usually their psychology demands that they, they either push this guy into a commitment and we have a big divorce process, et cetera, and then they hope that the new relationship survives or they push them and the guy pushes back and says, no, honey, I really can't commit to you in that way. So sorry, see you later, okay, which is what usually happens. So that's the, that is the perspective of uh, the female in a uh, infidelity situation where she is uh, seeking an outside relationship uh, out of her marriage. The, the second uh, perspective is she is the victim of this and her husband has got some outside relationship. Well, now the, the, the woman feels, you know, she has, may have a variety of feelings. She may not care, okay? Because it turns out she may not be into the guy that into him anyway. She may feel threatened financially or socially, but she may not really care that much. So uh, that could be one reaction. Another reaction could be that she is terribly jealous, that she is crazy about her husband, that she is feeling that he's slipping away and that, uh, that he may establish a relationship with a new person and he may leave her. So there could be great anxiety. Uh, there could be a great deal of anger uh, that could be associated with it because it feels like it's not fair because uh, she's committed so much of her life to him, they've had kids, whatever it is. So there's all kinds of perspectives that could be taking place there. There could be relief. There could be relief that says, oh, good. Well, now that you're doing that, we can get a divorce because I've been wanting one for 10 years. Okay, that could be the reaction. The reaction could, could be um, a fear that, that she's going to lose her partner that she's, she loves, but she's not that into, and he may not be that into her on the romantic level, but that this would be a great threat to a partnership and a family and, all, and both financial and social integration that takes place between two lives. Uh, and that may just feel like, whoa, that's scary. I'm feeling the threat of that and I don't like that feeling, okay? So that, that in other words, something is being threatened. So there's a variety of perspectives uh, and a variety of reactions that, that a woman might have in those circumstances. The, um, I guess the, then the perspective that you were uh, coming to would be, let's suppose the woman is, is single and she's having a relationship with a guy who is married. Um, the, why would, would the guy do that? Well, he's designed by nature to essentially look, proliferate his DNA you know, in ways that he considers to be advantageous. So he's looking for uh, uh, an individual that does that may have a variety of reasons why. He may be, feel very committed to and drawn to and, and uh, flattered and, and in love with this new partner and he may be not interested in his wife anymore. Completely possible. Uh, it could be that, that he's still into his wife and they still have a legitimate marriage, but he's seeking casual mating strategy on the side, okay? 
So the notion of if a guy cheated on, on her to get to you, will he cheat on you to get to somebody else? Um, that, that is an extremely simplistic formula uh, to describe patterns of human behavior. The, uh, is there going to be some degree of truth in it? Of course there is. Uh, is it going to be is it, uh, the notion of, well, if he cheated on you, uh, cheated on her to get to you, will he cheat on you to get to her? Answer, nobody knows. Nobody knows the cost benefit analysis that he will face uh, when he makes that decision. Will he have an, uh, an opportunity in a new situation that rivals the excitement of the opportunity when it is that he met you? Okay. Is your relationship uh, as potentially arid as his relationship with his ex wife? Answer We don't know. Okay. So, a some simple, simplistic rejection of the idea that, uh, uh, that he could be committed to you uh, in the same way that he was committed to her, but he'll dump you in the same way that he's dumping her. It's just simply ridiculous. It's there's every single individual circumstances are different. That's like saying a guy that got in a fist fight, well, I got a fist fight once, he's going to get a fist fight again. No, that, that may be the only fist fight he gets into it his whole life. And so the, uh, the, the situation, now the fact that he got into this fight even once tells you a little bit of something about him, okay? How much does it tell you about him? Well, we're not really sure how much. Now tell me if he, if he had three of them. Suppose he had three fist fights, you know, between the ages of 22 and 32. Three major fist fights in a bar, okay? What are the odds that he's gonna have a fourth one? Pretty good, okay? What if some guy, you know, is a, a flirtatious, swinging Mr. Cool, and he is, he's married and divorced three times and cheated on all of them, and now you're target number four. Now what do you think? Well, now you should be thinking. <laughs> now you should be thinking, okay, I'm not so sure that this is very solid ground. So that would be a little different situation uh, than, if it's, than if it's a, you know, a potentially unique situation. All right, so I think that covers that pretty well. Great. Well, thank you. And I know that you've covered this topic and casual mating strategy quite a bit on the Beat Your Jeans podcast, and there's sure. over all close to 300 episodes now. Okay, well, this is, a, this is a very poignant question from Gary. Dear Dr. Lyle, in a recent show, you seem tickled when asked whether it's better to be a has-been or a never-was. The question made me ponder, as I believe I'm in a worse category of never even tried. Raised on the East Coast to an upper middle class Jewish family, there was no question that I was going to be a doctor. The only choice I had is which Ivy League school to go to. I've helped a lot of people and done well in my career, but now I'm in my mid 60s and I realize I'm completely unfulfilled. The pandemic has gifted me with three extra hours a day where I don't have to commute or take an hour for lunch. So I've explored a bunch of different classes I wish I could have done in my youth, such as painting, magic, acting, and playing a musical instrument. I'm completely capable of living at or below my means, but I'm concerned about what other people will think if I quit my job and I need an exit strategy. And how do I stop feeling guilty that my mother will be turning over in her grave? <laughs> Yeah, you need to read a book called How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. Okay? So this is the perspective that I would want you to have. Perspective, uh, and it's, it, it, it isn't a simplistic answer, and I understand that it's complicated, but that the, um, if there's one thing that is sort of bizarre and deeply troubling about human life, if there is one thing, it is the denial of death. Okay, so uh, this makes it difficult for people to run cost benefit analysis that encapsulates the fact that they have a limited and permanently limited lifespan. This is, um, um, this is why one of the most extraordinary transformations that can sometimes happen in a person's life is to get a terminal diagnosis and then to find out that it was wrong. Okay. Uh, in other words, they, they live through a period of, oh my God, I'm down to the last two years. And then they find out, oh, no, it turns out a mistake was made. And so now they're like, boy, you just watched your mind put a whole bunch of things way forward and cast a whole bunch of other things to the side as you found out quickly what was really the most important thing, okay? 
Uh, I have done this kind of exercise uh, in my head consciously and deliberately. And one of the things that I've thought about is I've thought about if I had one day to live, what would I do with it? Uh, it's interesting what I would do. Uh, and my, my, my day would be unique and completely different than your own. But if I had you know, 16 hours and I knew that 16 hours from now, my death was certain, it wasn't gonna be painful, so I wasn't gonna have to, have to scheme to be around it, uh, but I was perfectly able and competent to, uh, to, to move around and do things, what would I do, okay? Well, I can tell you some things that I wouldn't do. I wouldn't hold a big party, okay? Uh, I wouldn't eat a bunch of indulgent stuff. I wouldn't hire five prostitutes and have some wild thing. I actually know what I would do, okay? It would, I would spend, um, of, the, of my 16 waking hours, I would spend probably 14 of them with a single individual, okay? So this is a, a past romance, uh, but that person is currently my best friend. So please, some people have heard the fact that some of her children come in and out and live in my, my house from time to time. My garage is still full of a bunch of her stuff. Uh, we talk yeah, at least two or three times a week. We are very close friends. I would spend, I would spend about two hours uh, with people. I'd shoot a few baskets with Alan and talk some things over. So that'd be 15 or 20 minutes. And that's no small thing when you've only got 16 hours left. Uh, my friend Forrest Gump, his name is Larry. Uh, Forrest Gump, uh, he, we are very good friends. Uh, we would also spend one-on-one -on -one time, okay? There would be select individuals. Then uh, there'd be some people that I'd spend a, a few minutes saying goodbye to, okay? Like AJ, okay? So there's been some people, some people there that I would want to say goodbye to. And then I would spend 14 hours straight with Melissa, okay? That would be it. We would talk about our lives, her kids, the future, what she was going to do. We'd go somewhere by a river, you know, uh, uh, probably uh, in the Sierras. And we would just, we'd have some simple, healthy food. And we would just talk about lives and all the things that we did. And so that, that is a, that's an exercise that I go through to, to let me know what's really the most important things to me. Okay. And so I would, how I found freedom in an unfree world is a, it's a cattle fraud to tell you that look out for other people's expectations as they, as they want to push and shove you around to get you to do things that, you know, you're doing to defend your status or what your mother wanted or anything else. It's like, wait a second, wait a second. That's because I'm not thinking of this thing as this is my time that I have this nervous system and I have this opportunity to create happiness inside this nervous system. And I only have so long to do it. It's kind of like if you went to Disneyland, if anybody that's ever been there and you, had, you went to Disneyland and you only had one hour in Disneyland, okay? And you were gonna take a friend there that had never been there, what would you go on? And the first thing that comes to my mind is Pirates of the Caribbean. And that's because my sister took me on that when I was about six or seven years old. Uh, she was, she took me to Disneyland. She was a few years older and our parents dropped us off. And my sister was older and wise, so she knew how to maneuver. And she very cleverly didn't tell me what was coming. Okay. So we got in these little boats and you're on the water and it's really cool. And then you hear this facing screaming. And then you realize I never forget to this day, 50 years later, Going down that first chute uh, in Pirates of the Caribbean, as you screamingly go down in your raft down underneath there, and then underneath there's this whole fantastic thing, and then it happens three times. You go down three. And uh, that, that was uh, exquisite. And so what, what would you do? There'd be certain things that I would do, okay? Because then after an hour, I, we have to leave. So you don't have any choice. You have to make those choices. If we fiddle around at you know, Bear Country Jamboree and we waste 28 minutes there, boy, did we make a mistake, okay? Don't waste your time at Bear Country Jamboree doing things that other people think are cool and you think are, are mediocre. Don't do it. Go right for what it is that you would love and put as much of that in your life as possible. That's how to make these decisions. 
And if you can live comfortably and not, you know, don't, not have to go to work that much to do things that you don't want to do, then don't do it. How I Found Freedom in Free World is a guidebook to try to extricate yourself from all the pressure of expectations that come from other people on your life. Yeah, I read it. Thank you. It, it, was, it was really eye-opening, but I think a lot of people are going to struggle with some of it because they feel guilty. Yes. And it's, a, it's the best we have, for, it's the best I have for trying to pull back and, and reduce some of that guilt. Do you think there's still time for Gary to wrap some myelin if he chooses one of these other paths in the, in the creative arts? Oh, of course. In other words, the, um, your, your, there's a Shakespeare uh, quote, I can't remember what it is, that what's one is done in life's soul, life's in the doing. So it's a... It's the process of making progress that actually causes human beings to feel good. And so as you, if you love to paint, um, you may love the idea of other people thinking that you're a good painter, at which point this is not going to be such a great thing. But if you actually really love the process of doing it, then as you make progress, it won't matter how good you get. It'll matter that you're making progress. Okay. That, that's what will feel very satisfying. So Life needs a balance. Uh, it's useful to have a balance that you are still productive to the community. So maybe you work one day a week or two days a week or, or you do something that the world finds valuable. So you get that reaffirmed. But we're trying to get these lives in balance. And very often, high achieving or successful lives are actually lives that are out of balance. Um, and one of the reasons they're out of balance is they don't actually have a very good calculation of their own mortality. So they just keep feeling like I'm acquiring status and I'm acquiring assets, but they're forgetting that the clock is running and you only have so much time at Disneyland, okay? So if you're some little guy that can trade other tickets in the corner of Disneyland and acquire more tickets and find people in the marketplace that will give you three of these tickets, these are old, Disney. now you're talking about an old man that had A, B, C, D, E tickets the Disneyland, the e-tickets were the fancy ones. But the whole idea is if you had some ability to keep acquiring resources, but you only get three hours on the grounds, careful. Don't acquire more resources than you have time to use. Doesn't mean you want to die broke. It just means you want to die smart. Okay? Don't, don't, don't have left a bunch of time on the table. I would feel sick if in my final day, I look back on that thing and I frittered it around and talked to all kinds of people that, you know, were nice people that meant something to me. And then I only had 15 minutes left for Melissa. Be like, uh, not a chance is that going to happen. You know, what's going to happen is at most everybody else, I don't even think I would give them two hours. I think I would give everybody an hour and I divide that up. I'd give my sister three minutes. You know, my sister's a fine human. We are tight. But you know what? It's not the same psychological connection as I have with Melissa. My sister gets three minutes. She'll say, good luck. I'll take care of stuff. I'll take care of mom, et cetera. Good, you know, best wishes with everything, et cetera. I'll take care of some other things that you need taken care of. All business. We're all good. See you. Okay, go with God in your life. And then, boom, the next time I'm, I'm next to that river in the Sierras and we're talking about our lives. That's how I would do it. And that's how I would encourage everybody to think about the time that you have left. The only problem, if you spend any time with Alan, he's going to tell you it's because you ate carrot cake. <laughs> that, that's true. That's so we, true. let's not tell him, you know, if you're going to go away. Right. That's right. If I understand you correctly, Dr. Lyle, you're, what you're saying is don't waste time on Mr. Toad's wild ride when you can be on Pirates of the Caribbean. That's right. That's, that's exactly, you got it, AJ. That's Unless, of course, that's the ride you prefer. And you know, it's interesting, Dr. Lyle, since the pandemic began, we can, I still am not allowed to do volunteer work because it's, they're still, they don't have had us come back yet. So the 10 hours a week I was spending doing volunteer work, I'm now doing my passion, which is improvisational comedy. And I can't tell you how many doctors and lawyers are in my acting classes because while they make good livings, they're completely unfulfilled in their career. Yes, very interesting. Balance, AJ. The, the modern world has, has thrown us some interesting problems where it's very easy for us to get things out of balance. Okay. 
So we, we uh, remember that in the Stone Age, we, we spent time, care, a lot of time was spent on food. A lot of time was spent on talking to everybody in the village, talking about things. A lot of time was gossiping. A lot of times was romance. A lot of times was kid raising. And, but there, there was a, it was very social with people it is that you knew and that you were close to. And that uh, a lot of laughter and a lot of goofing off and a lot of showing off. Okay. And a lot of times we, that's what you're finding with these, these doctors didn't get to show off. They didn't get to have the, the natural showing off displays that would have been part of human nature. Okay. And so the, uh, the guys that I meet with at the gym can't wait to get in there and show off to each other about what they can do on the basketball court. That's a, that right now I showed Alan a trick with shooting and he is so happy right now. And he just can't wait to show me what it is that he can do with it. That's, that's much closer to human nature than, you know, than, 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 uh, I don't know, an attorney figuring out whether or not we should sue or not sue. That's a, and so is that a useful and important part of society? Of course it is. But this other part, this interpersonal social, uh, sort of the stone ages process, that is, uh, that's the part we want to make sure, you know, we, we don't spend too much time uh, doing other things when you could be playing. Good. That's a beautiful place to end. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lau. We just love having you on. It's just so fun hearing from you. And I hope you'll come back next month. And I hope all of you will come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time. If you've watched all week, you know, all my doctors have been from India, but tomorrow we're going all the way to the United Kingdom. And for the first time, I will have a plant-based hematologist on who even knew there was one. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks Dr. Lau. And goodbye. Little